Midwest Farm Report, a rural area public relations program brought to you in the interests of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this listing area and others interested in seeing the farmer receive a fair price for what he produces. Now here is Mr. Herschel Ligon, president of the Wilson County chapter of the NFO. Welcome to another NFO program from Nashville, Tennessee. NFO is the National Organization of Farmers. Farmers that are determined to keep the family farm system from going out of existence. Every day in the United States, 324 farmers are quitting farming. In Tennessee, 62% of all farmers are in the poverty class. Farm credit is at an all-time high. The only reason farm loaning agencies continue us to loan money, to continue to loan us money, is our real estate has increased in value. They don't loan us money on our farming operation because they know it won't make any money. We are most happy to have a very important person on the program, a person that has served 12 years in Congress. He was on the House Agriculture Committee. Now he is on the Senate Agriculture Committee. We are most happy to welcome to our program Senator Ross Bass from Tennessee. Thank you very much, Herschel, and it's a real pleasure to be with you and to visit with you on uh, this program in the interest of uh, uh, better prices for the farmers' uh, products. Uh, as you say, I served on the Committee on Agriculture in the House of Representatives for eight years, and then immediately after being elected to the Senate two years ago, I made application for and was elected to the uh, Senate Committee on Agriculture. I've always believed that, uh, particularly in Tennessee, agriculture is the basis, really, for all of our economy. And if the farm people are not doing well, then we're in trouble. You mentioned the fact that 62% of uh, our farm people were in poverty. Uh, so many times, and particularly this is true at uh, the national level, uh, when they start uh, writing programs to assist people to try to elevate them out of the uh, cycle of poverty, they think only of the slum areas of the cities. Uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a great percent of the poverty in the nation today is in the rural areas. And this is the reason I've been so interested in legislation uh, that I know the National Farmers Organization is interested in also, in trying to promote programs to uh, let the farmers help themselves, uh, self-help programs. And then, of course, uh, we supported programs to try to uh, elevate the standard of living of the farmer, to try to get him uh, closer to parity of income, uh, to try to uh, design programs, really, that we hope may someday they be self-defeating. We hope that someday uh, these programs will put the farmer in a position so that he can go into the marketplace, market his products, and s receive a price for them without having to uh, carry on what is referred to as a subsidy programs. And I think that that uh, is uh, really in keeping with what your interests are as a farm leader. Senator, I know, well, uh, back better than 30 years ago, we had to have some kind of a farm program because the nation was broke and uh, that was started because the farmer went broke first. And we've had, uh, thank goodness we had those farm programs because they actually saved the nation, I believe. When they saved their agriculture, they saved the nation. But it has gotten to where now that looks like uh, there's not a whole lot the federal government can do about this farm problem. Looks like it's, it's just about come to the end. And we in NFO uh, appreciate what the federal government has done for us but we hope very soon to get this agriculture situation to where we can uh, get along on our own. And I'm sure you people in, in the Congress will be glad when we can do that and take a little burden off you, won't you? Well, uh, I, I, I'll say this to you. Nothing would please me more than to be able to see the uh, Tennessee farmer and, of course, the farmer all over the nation be able to produce his products, his, his farm commodities take them to the marketplace and receive a fair share of the consumer's dollar. Uh, you know, uh, just recently we've had a lot of talk about uh, farm prices increasing and this uh, increasing the cost to, cons to the consumer. Well, this is just not the truth. Uh, uh, the uh, farmer today uh, receives less uh, than he ever did of the consumer's dollar, or he has in many, many years. Uh, only 37% of what you go into the store and buy uh, actually goes to the farm itself. This includes meat products, uh, uh, wheat products, dairy products, everything else combined. And uh, 
So uh, being a, a member of the Committee on Agriculture, knowing how important uh, uh, these uh, commodities are and the prices that go into the economy in Tennessee, uh, we have worked very, very hard uh, to try to elevate the position of the farmer. And you were talk, uh, went back to the Depression of the 30s. Well, Herschel, I was born on a farm. Uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, uh, I was born on, uh, in a log cabin on what we call a hillside uh, cotton farm in Giles County. And uh, I know what it is uh, to live under those circumstances. And uh, I know, as you know, that in 1932, from 1932 on through 1935, the farmers were uh, just about starving to death. Uh, about the first job I ever had was helping measure land under the old AAA program. Well, uh, after President Roosevelt became president and uh, uh, we uh, put in some of these programs, it became necessary to come in and start regulating uh, the uh, production of some of the crops and to get rid of some of the surpluses so that the farmer could receive something for his products. Uh, and, and this was very important. Uh, uh, I worked in tobacco myself uh, as, as a farm boy, so uh, I have uh, had the experience of knowing what these problems are. And uh, I might add here, uh, uh, you don't mind if I get, uh, talk a little bit about politics, do you? No, Herschel? that's normal. Uh, since I'm a candidate for re-election to the United States Senate, uh, I don't know of any uh, legislation that comes before the Congress, probably with the exception of taxes, that is any more complicated than farm legislation. Uh, and uh, having had 10 years of experience in writing farm legislation, uh, I believe that this is important to the people of Tennessee to have some on, on, on the Committee on Agriculture that does understand the programs, the history of the programs, the necessity for them, one having lived uh, on the farm uh, himself. And this is uh, what my own personal situation is. And uh, so this is the reason that I have uh, uh, tried to stay on the Committee on Agriculture to try to elevate the standard of living of our people. Uh, to give you an example, uh, I was elected to Congress first in uh, 1954. Uh, at that time, the tobacco program was uh, just about to be destroyed. Uh, uh, the warehouses were bulging uh, with uh, tobacco, and the prices, the prices were being depressed. And uh, we had to almost rewrite all of this legislation. Well, I had lived and worked in tobacco. As a matter of fact, uh, I got my Social Security uh, uh, number working in, uh, on a warehouse floor in, a, in what they call a prize room uh, in, in selling tobacco. So I've had this experience in uh, working with agricultural products, uh, agricultural commodities, uh, not only in producing them, but helping work all the way. And uh, so uh, this is uh, what I'm talking about, politics. I hope that the people of Tennessee uh, this year will not sacrifice the experience and the knowledge of these programs uh, tobacco, cotton, wheat, uh, dairy, and everything else. And I hope that they will return me to the Senate so that uh, I can continue to work in the interest of the farmer. Well, Senator, we know from past experience, in fact, it's from recent experience, that, uh, that there's no substitute for experience. Now, you know the, the problem we got into about, you mentioned a minute ago, about, uh, well, it actually started with President Johnson's Council of Economic Advisors were advising him that the reason cost of living had risen was that the farmers were receiving too much for their production. You called me in Washington right quick. Right. Yeah. You said, how are you doing? I told you I was unhappy, and you believed that yes, too, didn't I you? I sure did. And well, uh, that's uh, right there. We found out later is a perfect example of not having sufficient experience because they found out that there was nobody on President Johnson's Council of Economic Advisors that had any knowledge of agriculture whatsoever. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, I remember our conversation very well, and uh, 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 I called the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Mr. Orville Freeman, and he came to my office after my conversation with you and uh, some other people called me in Tennessee, and uh, uh, I think he had been uh, misled himself and actually sort of fell into a trap of, uh, of uh, some of the people that were advising the President on the situation. And after that, uh, after our conversation, uh, if you remember, he issued a statement uh, backing off of this whole uh, problem because the farmers were not getting too much for their commodities. I'm happy to be able to sit here and say today that since 1960, as an example, the farm prices have increased uh, in Tennessee by 23%. Uh, uh, now, uh, the uh, beef and pork producers, if you remember two years ago, and by the way, this is an example of not having a control program. The, uh, the meat producers don't have one, and, and they do well. Uh, but 
in my two years in the Senate, uh, the price of uh, beef uh, products for the producer has gone up 20 percent. Well, this has meant uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars into the farm uh, uh, pro pockets of the farmers of Tennessee, and uh, we're happy to do this. Well, we didn't have to really establish any controls. One thing we did was to uh, uh, control some of the imports uh, that had been coming to this country on, on beef. But uh, uh, the, uh, the call from you, as an example, uh, coupled with uh, other information, and then my ability to be on the committee and call the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, I, I think it took some of the onus off of the farmers in this area. Right. Uh, you know, the old story goes around that uh, we won't call you politicians, but you people candidate for public office, why, they say, oh, they'll promise you anything they'll get there, then they forget you. Well, now, that has been untrue with my relationship with you. Uh, soon after you were elected to the Senate, you know, I was very anxious to appear before the Senate Agriculture Committee to get this true farm story before the public. And it wasn't convenient, but Secretary of Agriculture was coming to Lawrenceburg, and you invited me to meet down there. Well, you got delayed in Washington and get to make the meeting, but I was at the meeting. I remember setting up the meeting, and uh, uh, this is something we always try to do, uh, uh, being on the Committee on Agriculture, is to see that the Tennessee story is told uh, to the Secretary of Agriculture, and I remember very well the meeting that uh, I set up, uh, which you attended, with the Secretary of Agriculture, and uh, I know that it uh, was productive. He came back and uh, told me of the meeting he had with Tennessee farmers, and which he appreciated very much, while he was in Lawrenceburg. Uh, and uh, the Secretary has been here on many occasions. Uh, so uh, uh, this connection, this connection, I think, is important as far as the uh, uh, Tennessee farmer is concerned. Now, Herschel, I think it might be wise for you to uh, let the people know here exactly how uh, you feel on some of these programs as might be compared to the record that I've had in the Congress. Uh, and as you say, uh, t talking about uh, politicians making promises, uh, I like to run more on a record of what uh, uh, I think I have accomplished, and I think that uh, the record will show that I have carried out uh, uh, the platform that I announced two years ago uh, in the Senate. And a part of that was the agricultural program, which I stated uh, that uh, we were going to try to improve prices, and I gave specific ways that we were going to do it. All of this has been enacted into law. Another example was uh, recently a bill that we were able to pass uh, uh, to uh, bring hundreds of thousands of dollars in the pockets of the Tennessee farmers on uh, the uh, uh, cotton program uh, where uh, we were able to get a bill through. I know I stopped my campaigning and went, went, went back to Washington to introduce the bill, which allowed farmers to plant soybeans on the cotton acres that had been rained out. And uh, this will mean thousands of dollars. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, type of, uh, of legislation or this type of service to me is the thing that uh, gives me a pleasure by being in the United States Senate in order to try to help people. Something, there's one thing about that Lawrenceburg meeting that I'm sure you didn't know about, but uh, at that time I was a rookie NFO member. But I told the Secretary of Agriculture as an NFO member just what the farm situation was. And Nat Cowell with the Nashville Tennessee and wrote it up as an NFO member telling the Secretary of Agriculture what was wrong with the federal farm program. And that was the biggest boost NFO had had in the South at that time. It was, it was a trend, tremendous boost for NFO. Well, uh, I think it's very important uh, for the farmers to have a spokesman before our various committees. And I know your organization has been for, before our committee in uh, testifying on legislation. Uh, I think one of our big problems uh, in the commodity area is, uh, is having uh, uh, people uh, who know the problem and having them get together and uh, without a great deal of confusion. And uh, I know that uh, what you're interested in, I think, as an organization, is to uh, get the government out of the farm business. I think this is one of your uh, main programs. Well, nothing could please me more. I would uh, uh, like to see the day uh, when the uh, farmer uh, could go to the marketplace with his products and receive a fair price for them and not have to worry about government regulations and controls. Now, we have had those uh, uh, because of the uh, depression of the 30. We started these uh, programs, and they've been necessary. But uh, as a committee, a member of the Committee on Agriculture, I certainly would like to see the time when the farmer could go into the marketplace and could market his products and not have to depend on the government to 
uh, either supplement the price or to say he can't raise uh, but so many acres uh, and uh, this sort of thing. And I think this is the aim of uh, your aim. Senator, you know, uh, it's possible that you and I are near the same age. Uh, we both remember just exactly what the Depression was. Well, I'm very complimented if you uh, uh, seem to think that I'm as young as you are, Herschel. Well, you probably are. <laughs> but the point I'm getting at is this. We remember, we were old enough to remember that what happened to the nation when agriculture went broke, when agriculture was broke, no question about it. You know, many people don't realize that uh, just how much the whole nation depends upon agriculture. You know, we produce 70% of all raw material produced in the world. The farmers are the largest consumers in the world. Well, here is one of the things that uh, uh, actually scares me about farming and talking about our, our ability to produce. Uh, I know we get uh, condemned many times as farm people uh, uh, because uh, uh, we can overproduce. Uh, today in, in, in the United States, uh, fewer than 10% of our population are actually working in the production of food. And yet we are able to produce all of the food and fiber that we can consume in this nation in the best fed nation, the best, best clothed nation in the history of the world. Yet there are other nations where 85% of the people are actually working and trying to produce food and fiber and they still go hungry and do not have adequate clothing uh, to protect themselves. So uh, to me, uh, this is a blessing that we have uh, this, this great situation. Uh, I wish that we could increase our exports. Uh, this is uh, one, of the, one of the real problems. We're going to have to learn to, uh, uh, to trade more and to get into more markets and sell our commodities so that our farm people can continue to produce. But now, even though today uh, we think that we're overproducing and we do have some surpluses in, the, in, in our warehouses, uh, this is not the thing that really concerns me as far as the future is concerned. Because although today we have uh, all of this uh, extra production, uh, in our area, in our area in Tennessee today, in Middle Tennessee, the average age of the owner-operated farmer is 55 years of age. And you find very, very few young Tennesseans today who are graduating from high school, going back onto the farm and becoming farm producers. Now, this is really going to be a problem. Uh, in, in 20 years, if this situation uh, it continues to exist, we're going to be worried about where we're getting our uh, uh, food supplies instead of having a surplus. Uh, now, the, uh, the problem, uh, as far as I can see it, is the fact that the investment today, you mentioned the uh, cost of farming and then the cost of land. The investment in, uh, in farming today is one of the biggest investments in any other kind of business. To operate a 200-acre farm today, uh, it costs actually more money. The cost of the land, the cost of the machinery, the cost of the home on the farm, and all of the other equipment, it costs more money than it does to go down on the square and put in uh, uh, any kind of a business all at once right. that you can have. That's right. And uh, so uh, with this increased cost in running and operating only a farm, has run the young farmer out of, uh, out of the farm. And uh, uh, before too many years, we're going to get into a proposition of having the big corporations run the farm if we don't do something to, uh, to increase uh, uh, the incentive for the young man to stay on the farm. That, that is what we are worried about most, Senator, is, is uh, corporate farming. Uh, a lot of people might think, oh, well, let's get the big corporations in farming and they'll be so big and efficient that our grocers will be cheap. Well, they must remember this. There'll be such few corporations farming that they can get together and there'll be no limit to what they'll pay for the grocers in. You know, other countries have farming, but they've, now, they've found no farming setup as efficient as the family farm. Now, I'm glad you mentioned that about uh, the age of the, the farmers of the America today. You know, uh, some people have the idea that the only solution to the farm problem is for the farmer to get him a part-time job. In fact, the we have a former commissioner of agriculture in this state that says the only solution he knows of is for the farmer to get him a part-time job. Well, now, uh, you said the average age is 55 years. I don't mind telling you, I'm 48, Senator. What, what company would hire me at my age? What wage would I, I couldn't even make common labor wages. And then there too, you know, the, the extension service uh, encourages efficiency. And I guess that's the reason we're the most efficient farmers in the world. But now, 
Uh, you can't tell me you can be efficient when you're doing two jobs, and that's what we'd have to do. As one of our NFO members said, I guess, uh, I guess he wants us to, uh, to continue to feed the world, working 16 hours a day like we are, and then get us an eight-hour job to feed our family and uh, pay our debts. Well, what do you, what do you think about this part-time job business? Well, uh, it's impossible, really, for uh, the farm operation to be operated efficiently on a part-time basis. Uh, what we need is uh, full-time farm operators, uh, people who are on the farm, interested in the farm, owning their own land and owning their own machinery and trying to do the job to produce food. And I believe that it can be done and can be done efficiently in this kind of an operation. Uh, I know that uh, uh, many of our communities now are uh, trying to integrate farm and industry. Now, this is one thing, and I think it can be done. Uh, I think many of the uh, uh, communities uh, in our small uh, rural areas uh, have to have some industry in order to take care of the uh, overflow as, uh, as a result of uh, some of the uh, farm operations. But uh, it would be difficult for me to see uh, how a man can uh, uh, be a, a part-time farmer because, uh, uh, of course, even though the machinery is a lot different from what it was when I was back plowing a mule or something, uh, uh, you can plow a lot more acres uh, with a tractor. Uh, it's really uh, still a full-time uh, operation to raise the various commodities. And, of course, we in Tennessee are diversified. Uh, we, we raise almost every commodity in this state that can be raised either without uh, uh, irrigation or tropical weather. Uh, so uh, we in Tennessee have uh, a really a diversified farm operation and one that will allow a farmer to devote a part of his time raising one commodity, and then he can go back and uh, uh, devote the other part of the time. We have many farmers that raise, uh, that have a dairy, beef cattle, raise row crops, tobacco, wheat, corn, all of the other. Uh, so uh, farming can be a full-time job, and if we can see that the farmer gets closer to parity of income and see that he can go into the marketplace and sell his products, then he can't have a full-time operation. You know, in NFO, we aren't even asking parity prices. We're only asking a price that'll cover cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And you know, the, the whole problem is, Senator, we're the only business in the world that go to the marketplace and say, what do you give me? And then turn around and give the seller what he wants for everything we buy. Everybody else prices their production. That suit you have on, that was priced. And I'll tell you one thing, if you hadn't given what they wanted, you wouldn't have gotten it. So that's what we plan to do. If we don't get our price, we're just going to keep it a while until we get our price. That's, that's NFO. All in the world we're asking is a price that will cover cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Well, I think uh, there's uh, nothing unreasonable about saying that because uh, uh, I doubt that there is any group of people who put any, any more time uh, in their job than the farmers do. Uh, I, well, you know, they, what is the old saying? Uh, uh, a man's work from sun to sun and a woman's work is never done or something like that. Well, it's just about the truth uh, that uh, the farmer's work is from sun to sun. He doesn't operate on uh, an eight-hour, 40-hour week, and he can't if he's his, a farm owner producer uh, because of the necessity of time involved and because of the seasons. And actually, a lot of people don't think about this. Farming is one of the most hazardous uh, occupations in the world. Uh, we, uh, the farmer has to depend on the seasons, uh, the, the weather, and... Uh, uh, the uh, natural uh, uh, hazards of, uh, of everything that can strike anything and strike the farmer. And uh, he has that investment. He's got his seeds, his fertilizer preparation. And uh, actually, uh, I think probably for his investment and for the amount of time that he uh, consumes in producing the food and fiber to feed the nation is uh, about the uh, a least percentage of income of anyone else. And let me say this, uh, uh, you know, we're now involved in, in a war. Once again, uh, American fighting men are on foreign soil in Vietnam, trying to carry out our commitment there to help uh, prevent aggression from the North uh, and a communist takeover in South Vietnam. Uh, I was in the military, both in the infantry and the Air Force. I was an officer in the Air Force and an infantry role. And uh, I know that the the soldiers that I served with, uh, a great number of them came from the farm. And uh, I know the kind of stamina uh, that they had and uh, uh, the way they were dedicated and patriotic. I know of no group in the world that's more patriotic than uh, our rural people. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, something can be done to bring about an early conclusion of this struggle in Vietnam. But almost every time when you find one nation fighting another 
one nation trying to take over additional land. It's somewhere the breadbasket is involved. And uh, you show me a well-fed nation and, and one that is uh, producing the food and fiber necessary, and most of the time you'll find a happy nation, one that's not uh, going out and trying to uh, acquire other sources of, of, uh, of production. And now today, one of the problems in Vietnam, South Vietnam is one of the richest areas in rice production, agricultural. They really don't know how. But this is one reason that, that China and the North Vietnamese are so interested in acquiring this part of the, of the world. Uh, to feed their own nation. There's a breadbasket involved. Right. You know, you brought out something there that I've been strong on for quite a while. Uh, you and I were both captains in World War II. And uh, I know the kind of soldier that a farm-reared boy makes. They know how to work, they will work, and above all, they have good character, and that's something that uh, it's just hard to get around. And uh, when I started fighting this farm situation, that was the first thing that came in my mind. Now, a lot of people don't agree with me, but uh, you know we have these wars quite often. And I don't think we can get better soldiers from anywhere in the world than boys that are reared on the farm. And uh, lots of times, it's a pretty good idea to have some good soldiers, I'll tell you right now. Yeah, and in that connection, uh, I, I would like to say that as a senator, uh, we face these uh, grave problems in, involved in uh, uh, trying to see that our men are well supplied. Uh, I, uh, as I said, I hope that we can find an early solution to this problem. But one of my basic concerns as a senator has been to see that the American fighting man in Vietnam has everything necessary to carry out his commitment in the way of supplies, materials, and otherwise. And uh, recently we had a problem of uh, a ship tie-up, and I also serve on a committee on commerce in addition to the committee on agriculture, and uh, uh, my, the chairman of my committee asked me to go into this. I actually planned to go to Vietnam, but uh, about the time they had the internal uprisings there, I did not go because uh, the Secretary of State did not feel that it was wise to go at the time. But I called in the Under Secretary of the Navy and the people in the ship building business uh, in order to see that our uh, men uh, were being taken care of. Now this problem has been uh, greatly relieved, and our men are being uh, uh, supplied with the materials. But you and I both having been in the service, uh, we understand what it is. I, uh, as you said, I was a, a captain in World War II. I was a bombardier. Uh, I don't want to see anyone have to go on the battlefront uh, because I've been there. Uh, I've been uh, shot at, and I've been hit, and I've been shot down. And uh, I know what it means, and I know what the sacrifice that many of our uh, mothers and sisters and well, brothers, aunts, uncles, and fathers are going through. And so for this reason, I hope that before uh, you and I have a chance to sit down again and talk about farm problems, that some honorable solution can be brought about to this Vietnam War. Something, you know, we're running out of time. It looks like you and I pretty well talk the same language, and I wish we had a lot more time to talk about this thing, but time is, time is getting close. But uh, I'll say this much, uh, as I said before, uh, when I called you in Washington, why, you said, rest assured, your son was on your side, and I, I'll guarantee that. And uh, immediately after that, you state you went to see, you called the Secretary of Agriculture, and he came to see you. you there was a statement running in the local paper here that, uh, that you were on the farmer's side, and they weren't receiving too much for the production. You made a TV tape for it. And uh, I sincerely appreciate what you have done. I think it's a shame you people have to spend so much money to get elected. Uh, we want you back on that Senate Agriculture Committee, I'll tell you right now. Anyone interested in additional information about NFO, contact this station. A rural area public relations program was brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and by others interested in seeing the farmer receive a fair price for what he produces. This program was a videotape production.